Plato's Apology, or the Apology of Socrates, the account of Socrates' trial, he has been accused of undermining the traditional Athenian religion, and he has been accused of corrupting the young men of Athens. He begins his defense by stating that he is not eloquent. He says his accusers have spoken many things that were not true, but they said them very well. He says he will speak only the truth, but will not say it well. He claims that his real problem is not the formal accusations made against him, but a number of rumors that have been circulating about him for some time, poisoning the minds of the jurors, rumors about him and about the nature of his practice of philosophy and the sort of trouble he makes. And he defends himself from these rumors first by explaining how he became a philosopher and what is the nature of this philosophy that he is practicing. The story of how he became a philosopher begins when his friend Caravan goes to Delphi to visit the oracle. The oracle speaks for the god Apollo. Now, Caravan audaciously asks the oracle if anyone is wiser than Socrates, and the oracle says that no one is. Socrates hears of this and realizes that he does not have any wisdom, but he also realizes that it's not proper to think that Apollo has told a lie. What he said must have been true. And so there is a mystery here for Socrates to resolve. And so he begins to investigate, to figure out what Apollo meant. And he thinks the best way to do it is by seeking a wise man. And so he goes to various people in Athens who have a reputation for being wise. And he interrogates them and finds out that they do not have wisdom. And after doing this for a while, he realizes there's only one difference between him and these other people. They are both ignorant, they are both lacking wisdom, but he knows that he lacks wisdom and they do not know it. So he has that advantage over them. They are both ignorant, but he is aware of his ignorance. And he suggests that what the oracle meant, what Apollo meant, was that the wisest of men is the one who, like Socrates, realizes that his wisdom is in fact worthless. Wisdom for humans is to be aware of the fact that we do not have wisdom. Wisdom is awareness of our ignorance, thus suggests Socrates. And he proceeds to respond to the formal accusations, claiming that he is a very pious man, he is not uh, undermining the worship of the gods, and that he is not corrupting the young men of Athens, he is just training them to seek wisdom. And let me tell you something about the wisdom he is seeking. Above all, Socrates is seeking knowledge of the health of the soul. Socrates is seeking to understand in what way the soul functions best. He presumes that the soul is rather like the body. There's a proper function for it. And when it's functioning improperly, we will not be healthy and we will not be happy. And he also presumes that it must be at least possible for there to be someone who is an expert in the soul, as there is someone who is an expert in the body. If I want to know how to have a healthy body, I consult a doctor who can tell me what are the characteristics of a healthy body and what are the behaviors that lead to health. Well, it would be nice to have an expert in the health of the soul, wouldn't it? That's the sort of wisdom Socrates seeks, and he's encouraging the young men of Athens to do the same when they come to him with their questions. His wisdom is not to answer these questions, but to understand the questions and to understand that he does not know the answers. And he denies the formal accusations and explains that this is the sort of thing he is after. This sort of wisdom, and that's all he's doing to the young men of Athens, encouraging them to seek it. He says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And you, Athenian jurors, there are 500 men in the jury, 500 men of Athens, who will decide his fate. You, Athenian jurors, also should seek the, to have just and good and healthy souls, and you should care about these things. Nevertheless, they convict him as guilty, and they sentence him to death. And towards the end of the dialogue, he explains that he is not afraid of death. He knows that to 
cease practicing philosophy would be to disobey the, uh, would be to abandon the mission that Apollo had given him. And he knows that would be wrong. But he does not know whether death is actually bad. In fact, he gives us an argument that death might be just fine. Either there is life after death or there is not. If there is, then death is the gateway to another life. If there is not life after death, then death is the end of experience and the nearest equivalent in our own experience is a very good night's sleep. And therefore, either way, death is nothing to be afraid of. But injustice is, to be is something to be afraid of. Doing what you know is wrong is something to be afraid of. And neglecting his practice of philosophy is something that would be wrong. And he fears that in a way he does not fear death.